Okay. Good morning, still everyone. Um, something at G50 we use and we say is be curious, not judgmental. And uh, it helps us sort of stay focused on what we're doing here. G50 IPO in August of 2021. Uh, it was built uh, for exploration in Nevada and Arizona. Uh, precious metals and strategic minerals, um, mostly. Um, we're very science-backed and process-backed. So, you know, first principles of geology, we're going back to old school basics of um, historical producing parts of both, uh, both states, uh, back into geochem, soil sampling, geophysics, mapping structure. Then we put it all into leapfrog, digitize it, and then we go and, and drill. So in the last three years, we've done all that work on our two main projects. Um, we've done, uh, completed four drilling programs in three projects in two states, and we've got two discoveries. So it now feels like the right time to, to tell everyone about it. So the real core value proposition of G50 is, is our people. And uh, probably 100 plus years of experience here. Um, some, hopefully you'll know Rob Reynolds is in the room here, and feel free to go and, and uh, to pick his brains. Uh, Delta Gold back in the 80s through to their success of exploration in the WA gold fields and Africa, uh, joint ventures, you know, exploration success, funding, production, and then, and, and then exits. Uh, Bernard Rowe, who's from INEA, he's the brains trust of G50 in a technical sense. Uh, the Rylite Ridge project in Nevada, um, so that's a lithium boron project. They've got funding from the DOE, uh, about to finalise their record of decision and permitting, and then they're on their way. More recently, Ian, who's in the room, also joined us. Uh, you might know Ian from Senex. He took that over a 14-year period from a $50 million company to a, a taking private transaction for over a billion dollars. Uh, and then with their recent permits and updates, they're a multi-billion dollar private oil and gas uh, company in the east coast of Australia. So myself, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, I get the short straw to come up and, and be here with you, but there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes at G50. Danny Sims, who's, the, who's very um, important for us in our Arizona project, PhD in structural geology, worked for Freeport uh, in Grasberg in Indonesia, uh, Tech from Inco at Red Dog in Alaska, and then Shamila joins us from large multinational uh, pharmaceuticals. So um, a lot of experience, uh, a lot of old hands here. So gallium's kind of new for most people. Um, you know, we talk about having some, we've made a discovery here. We're 12 months into this process already. I'm trying to sort of shine a light on what gallium is and where it's used. The addressable market's massive. It became tropical in August last year when China put in export um, restrictions and controls. They've honoured that in the last 12 months. Uh, it's almost disintegrated down to nothing. So the market outside of China is ostensibly zero. The gallium prices responded accordingly. Um, it was already moving up from 2018 into 2021. Uh, and that's basically, you'll see the demand drivers and that explains why it's been moving up. From 2022 onwards, the supply cuts and now everyone's sort of looking for it. This is more of a refined product. So this is a $900 a kilo. Uh, it's on the move despite uh, Warren's, uh, Warwick's sort of predictions on commodity prices. This is one of the only ones still going up. For those who have traded, you know, coal stocks 20 years ago, old fashioned contracted pricing once a year, gallium's kind of like, you know, the demand is driven by the consumers and then the seller is one only, China. They control 98% of the market. And so I've grabbed some select quotes here from the FT. Uh, they put out three different articles on gallium in the last four weeks. Very sensitive now in strategic sense. For what it's worth, I look at the periodic table and I look at the underinvestment in commodities as a whole in the last 20 years. I think every metal on the periodic table is, is critical. Within that, there are strategic metals and uh, you know, that becomes more of a defence point as well Then also who owns it all. So Indium Corp, you should keep an eye on them. They're um, one of the biggest suppliers of complex uh, semiconductor materials into the North American market. When they say that they've got none left, then it's getting pretty scary. So trying to contextualise gallium, what it's used for in the size of the market, okay? So I call it the lifeblood of, of the modern world. The old world would have been probably the steel market, and so I can do some comparisons here for you just quickly. So the global semi-market is roughly half a trillion dollars. It's growing at three times global growth at about 9% CAGR, expecting to be about $1.3 trillion in about eight to 10 years' time. So what's driving that 5G, 6G technology, AI, Internet of Things, self-driving cars? For me personally, 12 months ago, if you said AI was a real thing, I would have said, I don't know, let's wait and see. 
I think 12 months on, we can kind of say it's real and it's here and it's going to stay. Um, so within that, the key trends is this new technology driving for efficiencies. So if you think in the next 10 years, we need, I think we all agree, global growth is going to be more energy intensive and not less than the last 10 years. So on the basis we can't build brand new power generation in the next 10 years fast enough, incumbent energy systems need to be more efficient. And this is where gallium and gallium nitride will come in. And so there is, there is nowhere in the ecosystem where gallium and gallium nitride won't touch anything that's electrified. So rapid market adoption, okay, it started with defence, you look on the far right there, so it came out of the DOD and DARPA. Uh, they utilised it in basically uh, radar technology. So if you think 10 years ago you're tracking planes and intercontinental ballistic missiles, now you're trying to track drones and smaller objects moving faster and lower. They need to change the technology. So in 2019, Raytheon got a $300 million contract and they're building out massive radar capability with gallium nitride. That's now turned into a $3 billion project and it keeps on growing. It crossed the Rubicon into the consumer consciousness in 2021. Apple utilises gallium nitride in their fast chargers, so if you've got an Apple or a Samsung phone, that big chunky bit that plugs in the wall, that's gallium nitride. So in the space of three or four years, we went from DARPA to then consumer electronics, and now we're backfilling the rest of it. So what I will highlight today is probably more integrated circuits in the power IC market, so data centres and hyperscalers and EVs and so on but it's used everywhere. If you've got any experience with, say, Tilix Pharmaceuticals, Clarity Pharmaceuticals, the radiotherapeutics, that's a gallium-68 isotope, so it's non-toxic. They use that for targeting cancer cells. You're going to hear about gallium a lot over the next sort of two to five years. Where do we fit in? So there's only three occurrences of gallium in the lower 48 states in the US. Uh, ours is now the fourth. The other two sit in uh, rare earth ore bodies. No one's recovered gallium successfully from a rare earth ore body. I'm not saying they won't, but uh, at the moment they haven't. Um, ours doesn't sit in that. So we're close to infrastructure. We're on patented claims, which is private property. Um, our grades and intercepts we'll get to in a minute, which are huge. Uh, in the last 12 months, we've spent a lot of time understanding the geology, the controls, and then path to market and so on. And I'll, and I'll show you where we've got to. Close to the end markets and strategic location. And so that's how we fit in. If there's only one slide you get out of the 13, 14 slides today, this is probably the main one. And it gives you an idea on the addressable market and what we're dealing with. So this is just looking at big tech data centers in the US, 500 odd between these guys and, and growing. So there's a, this is same again for Western Europe, same again for, for China and, and East Asia and growing fast. So if anyone's a next DC shareholder, sort of take note. Potential savings, this is trying to now bookend what one tier one data centre operator could save, okay? So you've got 10 shelves uh, in your data centre. Uh, if you replace 10 of your silicon-based power integrated circuits and put six gallium nitride ones in, you free up the real estate to put in more servers so your, your revenue can grow. You get a cost saving from that. So gallium nitride, what it does, it facilitates electron mobility in electric hardware, electricity. So it's like turning your garden hose into the Sydney Harbour Tunnel, but you don't get increase in, in heat, and then you don't get, uh, and then you get the efficiencies as well. So the benefit for the hyperscalers and the data centres is that effectively. So you're looking at, on one standard tier one data centre, your server per rack go from 30 to 34, you get the revenue increase, you've got the cost saving, and it defers that capital expenditure you know, by about 840 million. So adding all up, it's roughly $2 billion of savings, so times that by 500 and then times that by three gives you an idea, you can sort of backwards solve that half a trillion to trillion dollar marketplace. So uh, we're pretty excited by, uh, by where we're going and, and where this works. So that was just data centers and hyperscalers. You know, there's also the opportunity now into the electric vehicle market. And so uh, this current quarter, so um, out of South Korea, um, SK Key Foundry have developed a gallium nitride hardware. They're delivering that to Tesla this current quarter, starting off with a couple of devices that we know of at the moment. And so in the effort to get more efficient and then how we use it within vehicles, you know, these guys, uh, this is, comes out of a YOL group out of uh, Western Europe. They, uh, they market research the sector. Starts off at two, we can see it being used everywhere. One of the limitations for robo-taxis is the radar and the LIDAR technology. You can't get the information out and back fast enough. And so hopefully with the gallium nitrite and uh, with the hardware, that, that can help with that. 
more efficient charging, so it's not just for electric vehicles, it's battery hybrids, the whole lot. So more efficient charging from your ICE uh, motor inside the vehicle. So the, the adoption is, is pretty significant. We grabbed this from Navitas. I snuck onto one of their um, uh, earnings calls earlier in the year. This kind of just bookmarks for them what they're trying to do, the brand names they're working with. For us, Gallium's 12 months old. Gallium Nitride's an understanding. We're starting now from a pretty low base. These guys have been looking at it for 20 odd years, right? And so they're already working with like NVIDIA, Meta, uh, and on the hyperscaler space. And you can kind of see the value proposition for the, for the EV manufacturers. So you're gonna to start to see it in a lot of vehicles over the next few years. So then where does G50 fit in? And then how do we solve this problem? So China produces 98% of the world's gallium requirements. The beauty of gallium, it's secondary in other ore bodies. There's no such thing as a primary gallium ore body. So for us, it was serendipity. We are drilling for these high-grade precious metals opportunity in the copper molly porphyry setting. <clears throat> at surface, you get this argillic alteration and lots of gallium in it. We looked at other copper molly porphyries around the world, and for some reason, they don't have any gallium. Um, I would argue that it doesn't really matter. I think you heard from Justin earlier today, from the size of the market where we're going, we're all going to need lots of it. And so I think there's going to be room for all of us. So we're in northwestern Arizona, about an hour and a half from Nevada, uh, from, from Vegas. Uh, Kingman's similar to my hometown, Kalgoorlie, about 25,000 people uh, mining in the area. But, but mostly it's uh, on Route 66 and it's a tourist spot as much as anything else. We made a new gold discovery, so we ticked the box on our first principles exploration. We wanted to find one and we found it. So 35 metres at 5 grams gold and 6 grams silver uh, includes about 9 metres of 19 gold and, and 17 silver. So uh, we're pretty excited. I show you this because not many people understand. Lots of silver within this as well, so it's a polymetallic ore body. When drilling, we did multi-element assaying um, because of the porphyry nature of the, of the setting. So um, we found the gallium within that in our normal course of work. But basically, silver, if you look at GRCO3, um, you know, almost 30 metres of 158 gram silver, including 10, man, 10, 10 metres of almost 400 grams. That's a 400 gram metre intercept. Like, that's a brand new discovery. We barely talk about it. The gallium for us will probably be a quarter of the value of the project, half of it will report to the gold and the silver, and so that's the core value proposition. The argillic alteration is something we have to get through to get to the gold, and so you know, 10 years ago, if you're looking at a copper molly porphyry, you would have dug this up and probably junked it, and gone into the tailings, been part of the tailings. So uh, we think it'll help with the potential you know, pre-strip and issues like that. There's gold everywhere, uh, lots of silver everywhere, and we see that as our main opportunity. So the gallium halo comes through our normal course of work, multi-element assaying, and then in this advanced argillic alteration. For any of the geos in the room or remotely interested, Dick Silito, well-known porphyry expert. This is his model, metal zonation. So you've got the copper molly porphyry in the middle. As you come out, you get high-grade zinc and lead, and then the gold and the silver veins with it. Um, almost all copper molly porphyries will have this advanced argillic alteration. It's usually disappeared in the weathering by now. For some reason, we're lucky and ours is in situ, and we drilled through it, and we've got lots of it. The intercepts, think of them as silver intercepts. The value proposition per tonne of gallium is similar to a silver, and so that's why I show the gram metre intercepts. They're, they're, they're significant. So reported gallium, I'm not here saying I've got rock chips and soil samples and things like that. I've drilled this thing. There's 14 holes, two diamond holes, 12 RC. They're our average intercepts on the left there and other companies that show their gallium grades and intercepts as well. When we originally published our gallium discovery, we thought it was in the zinc sphalerite and associated with the zinc. Turns out it's not, it's in this alteration. Um, that's better for us. No one's really commercially recovered gallium from, from a sulphide. Um, lots of bench testing, lots of university studies on it. And so we think for all intents and purposes, it looks more like a China style ore body. Um, now, no one knows what that IP is, I've asked around, uh, especially to, to the specialists. No one knows. So the bauxite that China imports runs 50 grams gallium, they recover 10% of it. 
I'm guessing there's something in between that compromises the, the bauxite into an aluminum and then to aluminum. So uh, that, that's kind of the basic process. That's all we know so far. But we, we know where it's not. It's not in the sphalerite. We've done that sort of mineralogy and test work. Um, we've now got our processes in place working towards what we think it is and, and how we get it out of the ground. So um, in the last 12 months, we've done a lot of work trying to figure it all out and uh, we think we're a lot closer now. So uh, come over to the booth. Uh, I'm North Sydney based, but um, yeah, open for, for a chat.